Alright everybody, so we're going to spend some time looking at different oceanic habitats. Um, just be aware this is a long video, probably wouldn't expect you to read it or listen to it all at one time, but um, yeah, just go for it. Um, what we're going to be talking about are, you know, I can't cover every single different hab habitat, so I'm kind of going to generalize some um, soft sediments and um, then go through some harder sediments and then some sp specific habitats that you want to spend some time on. Um, so let's start thinking about soft sediments. Um, what I mean by this is, you know, basically not a bunch of rocks, but like either silt or sand. Um, and really what this is, is a story of hidden biodiversity. So when we look here, we see, you know, you go in your beach off of Florida and you look in the water and there's nothing there, right? Well, there's little, little heterogeneity to the system, so there's really no place to hide except burrowing underwater or burrowing underground or being extremely camouflaged. If you were to look closely at this sand in the background, you would see it's covered in stingrays, flounders, um, fish that, you know, you can see here's the tail, here are the, um, I don't know, I can't even really see the eyes, but they're they're up here, right? Um, but then we have little grass eels that as you were to, would swim close, they would definitely hide under underground. So there's plenty of habitat, there's plenty of nutrients out there, except it's just really hard to live in this environment because um, there's really no place to hide um, and it's hard to get away from predation then. So when we think about um, the soft sediments, we should really be thinking about three microhabitats. Well, you can swim in the water column, you can be on the sand, or you can be in the sand. Now each one of these things has its own benefits, right? Being swimming up in the water column, easy movement, um, can see where, you know, see danger um, on the sand. Uh, in contact with a decent amount of nutrients that will be in within the sand and the organic material there, but you're not as mobile. Underneath the sand, definitely not mobile, but a little bit more protected. So let's go maybe underground here for a second, and let's think about at the small scale. These interstitial spaces are just chock full of myofauna, extremely small organisms that will be dominated really by mo microbes, and that will be most of the secondary production that we're thinking about in this system. But um, there will be some photosynthesis. Think about diatoms here. Marine diatoms are going to be extremely abundant on the top little layer of, of the sand. And remember, you're not going to have very many green algae or soft-bodied algae because they're not going to be able to survive in this system. We have a lot of water movement, sand is going to be whipping around all over the place, and unless you have a hard glass silica cell wall like the diatoms have, you're not going to be able to survive and um, you're going to get crushed. So that's why we see diatoms dominating these systems. Um, Really then, within, you know, get a little bit bigger, think about the animal phyla. What we see is pretty much everything you'd ever find in other places. They're just super tiny, okay? So most of the invertebrate phyla are present. You find arthropods, you find um, mollusks, you find any type of worm you want to think about. But they're all really, really tiny. When we think about macrophyla, then, Really, diversity is going to correlate with sediment size. The closer the habitat, the coarser the sediments are, the more um, organisms, more diversity you'll find. But that doesn't necessarily mean abundance. So we find um, that mud is, um, you know, like think of like an estuary flowing into the ocean. We find a whole lot of mud and really low diversity, but really high abundance, okay? And now, why is that? So, organisms, not that many things can tolerate burrowing in mud and the low oxygen conditions and all the things that go along with that. But if an organism can make it there, they're gonna be very, um, 
abundant, right? Because there's essentially no competition for anything else. You'll find so many other, um, th th they'll just be neighbors upon neighbors and neighbors. This is li little worms that we find in here. Um, and because there's no competition with other species, they only have to fight amongst themselves for space and nutrients. And so you can have really high numbers, but low diversity. Um, most of the organisms you're gonna find that are burrowing here are gonna be polychaete worms, crustaceans, lots of different mollusks. And really there's two ways to live here. You either sift the sand, like these little bubbler crabs are doing. So they're uh, crabs that live under, under the sand at low tide, uh, or sorry, when the tide goes out, so when it's at low tide, the bubbler crabs come out and uh, sift all the sand and get all those, those myofauna stuffs, all those really tiny little organisms that are in the interstitial spaces between the sand and going to be eating those up. And um, then they go back under, under the sand for when the water comes back. Or <coughs> when that water comes back, you just wait for it. Um, I sh sorry, this isn't just intertidal, I should say. It's also down deep in the water um, where they're going to be filtering water. And so they're going to be filtering out the phytoplankton, filtering out the zooplankton and all that stuff. So um, check out two videos here. Start for the mole crab video. Start at um, 440. I'll link to those in the description. But uh, really cool organisms, especially that mole crab, how it can... Um, swim, almost swim through this liquefied sand. So when they go out a little bit deeper, we see that a lot of these soft sediments are um, dominated by seagrass, okay? Now, seagrass are the only angiosperms that we find. Um, what I should say is they're not actually grass. They're not in the grass family, the um, classic grass family that you would have that's, you know, um, just out in your lawn right now. But um, they're going to be in the shallow nearshore soft sediments. And this is where we find um, all of these, these grasses. There's a variety of species. There's not just one species. And there's a variety of, I think, different families also. But um, they all kind of look the same. Now, what they are are these underground uh, roots with rhizomes and then the blades, the leaves, I shouldn't say blades, these are actual leaves here that are coming up. Um, and because um, seagrass has a large underground component that undergoes a lot of respiration, the, they need a decent amount of light. So algae can go, grow down, uh, successfully photosynthesize with just 1% of incident light, whereas seagrass needs about 11%. And that's because they have so much of this underground root that um, really requires a lot of oxygen and uh, energy production to actually feed it. Um, but in super clear water, you can find them down to about 70 meters. Uh, you don't find them around estuaries very often just because too many river sediments will shade them out and not, they'll not be able to grow there. So what we see as seagrass is that they don't have stomata. Right? They don't have those little tiny holes that allow gas in. They're underwater the whole time, right? Having those holes would be counterproductive um, and just let the water in, right? So what they have is a really thin cuticle which allows CO2 to diffuse across them and they have really large gas vacuoles inside that keep their leaves afloat up into the water. How the seagrass reproduces is it's mainly vegetative, right? Generally, the roots are growing out underneath and then they just pop up another little seagrass as it goes out. Um, they do actually have some underwater flowering. Um, and the thing is, um, all pollination is done underwater, except it's really bad. It doesn't work very well. And the seeds don't really do a good job of germinating and initiating new patches. However, it's really the only way that new patches can get established. So um, we do see, you know, the seeds do work, um, just most of the reproduction is done just by the, a lawn of seagrass being growing out further and further away from the central patch. Things that are eating this are uh, plenty of fish, uh, sea turtles, dugongs, waterfowl, sea urchins, um, 
what we see though is most of the grazers, like the dugongs and the turtles, and a lot of the fish actually, are either extinct or greatly reduced, okay? Um, and what's interesting is even a lot of these organisms that are eating the seagrass are not actually di digesting the seagrass. Again, it's just like that uh, consumption versus assimilation paradox where you have a lot of organisms really gaining the, um, the stuff, the, the, their nutrients from the epiphyte. And you can see that on these little blades of grass here where you have, um, wait for it, there we go, um, you know, definitely a bunch of paraphyton growing on top of those blades of grass that then that's where they're gaining the nutrition. So, and this really releases really nutrients. As you can see, imagine this dugong here that's um, vacuuming up the seafloor is really redu releasing a bunch of nutrients that uh, more epiphyton and more seagrass can use then later on. Um, Dugongs are this really cool organism that used to be, there's huge herds around Australia and Southeast Asia. Um, and now we've really just eliminated them to relic populations. Check out this video, um, I'll link to it in the description um, of dugongs um, you know, just mowing a path down through the, uh, the seagrass beds. And we also see now, realistically, most of seagrass uh, herbivory is done via um, sea urchins and that's pretty much all that's left at least that's ecologically relevant now. So organisms are really using um, um, seagrass habitats as a nursery. Okay so we know there's lots of food here there's lots of um, and, and there's a lot more structure. So there's three-dimensional habitats where these little baby fish can be, you know, hiding in the, around the grass and able to um, grow up and get to be relatively big before they need to be out into the open ocean on their own. Um, another uh, habitat that is in the soft sediments, that requires soft sediments, is mangrove forests. So mangroves are these poly polyphyletic, meaning they're not all in the same group, right? There's different families, um, different, all sorts of different um, strategies that organisms, that these mangroves have. But generally what we see is they have these stilt roots and they're in the intertidal and estuarine areas. You need a little bit protected shoreline for them to grow. You cannot have just, um, like in the middle of the ocean, a patch of mangroves. Really, they need to have stable sand and mud, and they need to have some freshwater influx to limit the amount of salinity. They cannot grow in pure salt water. Um, realistically, we don't really know that much. It's really hard to access. Um, these, imagine, you know, walking through here, you're in mud up to your hips, and then trying to walk through these trees. Um, it's really hard to do. So um, people just haven't really studied them very often just due to their hard access. What we know about man mangroves though is they're in a highly variable environment. So tides are coming in and going out, salinity can change, turbidity can change, and it's a really harsh environment. So what we see is vivipary is really common. Vivipary is when a uh, a, a seed actually germinates on a tree. So what we have here is that this is a seedling, a baby mangrove, okay? And because it's so stressful, low light, um, and the underground root competition is crazy, a seed on its own is never gonna ger uh, germinate. So what happens is they germinate on the trees and they create this seedling. Now this thing gets pretty heavy and it's heavier on the bottom and eventually, um, this will fall off. Now if it falls off at low tide, this will basically spear into the mud and then the little roots will come off from the edges of it. If it um, falls off during high tide, then these will, it'll, you know, land on its, basically float in the water and land, um, either land on its side or be vertical in the water like this, that then at the next low, low tide, the bottoms will contact with the water 
and they'll have a chance for them to be able to spear into the water or, or in, into the dirt to start grab a hold and become a new mangrove tree. Mangroves are super, super important because near shore secondary production is linked to how much mangrove uh, ex organic matter is exported into the system. Okay, basically what that means is the more mangroves you have, the more fish you will produce out outside of the habitat. Um, it's because the fish are using these places as nurseries, but they're also a lot of these this is a lot of organic matter. Remember, ocean water is super old, doesn't have a lot of nutrients, so any organic matter input into it will have a huge impact, um, disproportionately large impact on adjacent um, productivity. Um, so uh, just like in um, freshwater ecosystems, we have shredders too, uh, but the shredders are kind of this one family of crabs that um, make these little burrows underneath and eat up all the leaves whenever they can. Um, these burrows increase oxygenation of the sediments and just help everything all around. Um, as these, these crabs are eating up these leaves, then they're also releasing a bunch of nutrients that way. The roots themselves, those stilted roots that are making that super um, complex three-dimensional environment below the water are a great sub substrate for invertebrate attachment. So sessile invertebrates can attach there and really increase the local biodiversity. And the same for fishes, right? That three-dimensional um, area is extremely, uh, extremely useful for them. The fish don't spawn there. Um, they spawn out in the open ocean, but they use it as a nursery because there's more food. It's a refuge from that physical stress of having to be out in the open ocean. And then there's a lot less predation because a lot of the big predatory fish can't fit in between those, um, those roots. All right, so let's move to the subtitle Rocky Habitat. So this is underwater, right? completely underwater, never exposed by tides, and with rocks. Now, what we find is the dominant organism is really determined by the slope. So if you have a really steep area here, like a cliff face, you're only going to have non-moving sessile invertebrates there. If it's flat, you have a good place for kelp, um, kelp growth. So let's spend some time thinking about kelp. Kelp is a macroalgae. It's a huge algae. Right? Now, depending, there's all sorts of different kinds, types of kelp, but um, generally the um, body shape is there's holdfasts, there's stipes, and there's blades, and um, then the fronds, right? The fronds are the, you know, just basically like branches. Now, we use all these different words. You know, if you were to call these roots, uh, a botanist would get upset because those are not roots. They're holdfasts. They don't absorb um, nutrients or water that way. But um, really all they're meant to do is hold the uh, kelp in place, okay? Then at the, um, at the junctions, you can see them here, right? All these little balls here are filled with air, which keep the kelp afloat and up into the water, the water columns so it can reach light. Now kelp are growing extremely fast. They can grow a half a meter a day in, in the best of conditions. Um, they're perennial plants, meaning they're lasting a long time um, and uh, over multiple years. And they require a hard sediment. So that hold fast needs to be attached to rocks or bedrock there. If like a river were to come in and dump a bunch of sediment, that's okay for the adults because they can, they're, you know, you look at this picture here, they're way up into the water, they're gonna be fine but recruitment of new individuals will be really hard because the uh, kelp are just tiny little babies, you know, growing from the bottom up, and that's not going to work when, if you have too much cloudy water above you and you can't get sunlight. Where we find kelp most common are in cold, nutrient-rich water. So off the coast of California, up through Alaska, right? Um, not as much kelp in the Atlantic because the Gulf Stream brings too much warm water, so you don't have it as much as common. But this is a story of a heterogeneous habitat, right? The more it's, you know, even, you know, a step above seagrass where you get more and more um, 
three-dimensional areas, more niches for organisms to inhabit, and you just get a lot of really cool stuff here. So what we see is kelp forests are really dependent on low grazing. Okay, so there's this story of the sea otters. And um, sea otters are these super cute animals um, that live um, along the west coast of the United States um, and Canada, right? Well, they're over in Russia too, but let's not, let's not t talk about that necessarily. So what we know is that in the Victorian era, um, we started hunting these things. In the early 1900s, we were hunting them almost to extinction for their fur. They're extremely furry, and that's how they keep warm in the really cold water. Um, the, uh, so we hunted them almost to extinction. And what sea otters do, though, is they eat um, their favorite food are sea urchins. They figured out a way to open them out without getting stung by their, their long, long, ten or their long um, stingers, um, their spines, and um, they eat just tons of these sea urchins a day. Now, if you've ever eaten a sea urchin, which I have, it's a super huge disappointment because it's this relatively large organism. You crack it open and you slurp up this tiny little pile of goo um, that are pretty much just the ovaries and the testes. It's not that great. I probably won't ever eat another sea urchin again just because uh, it's not worth it to me. But um, what happens? So we get rid of the uh, sea otters and sea urchin numbers explode. Okay, And what they do then is the sea urchins are underneath and they're going to be eating the uh, holdfasts, the holdfasts of the kelp. And then what you're left with is um, all the kelp goes away and you're left with just a bunch of sea urchins milling around at the bottom of the ocean floor um, trying to eat, find stuff to eat and eating any kelp that come across. So what we saw is when we started stopping hunting of sea otters, uh, the sea otters came back and there was plenty of food for them because all the sea urchins are there. Um, the sea, urchin, sea otters would come back, eat up the sea urchins, and um, kelp forest came back and fish came back and everything. It's this really trophic cascade where um, taking out one keystone predator like the sea otters um, really hurt the rest of the whole ecosystem. So uh, let's then move into the rocky intertidal zone. Okay, so what we're talking about are, you know, the areas that ex it gets exposed by, um, by the tides, but it has to have rocks hard. We're not talking about a sandy beach here. Okay, we're talking about a rocky shoreline. Think about like Maine or Oregon or something like that. The thing about the Rocky Intertidal Zone is that it's an interaction of physical tolerances, competition, and predation, and we'll kind of see how that happens. It's an extremely physically demanding environment, right? There's wave action that's coming in, pounding on the shoreline. So the organisms you find there are a lot of really hard things, right? So mussels and barnacles and um, starfish. You don't really think of starfish as being hard, but if you ever touch a live one, it's really just like a bony plate connected with some tissue in there. But um, they're also gonna be drying out, right? So it's this extreme environment where twice a day you get um, completely dry, twice a day it's completely wet. So in the upper zones you see um, more shelled organisms, but as you go down in the tidal zone you see a few more soft body stuff as it, um, they don't get exposed as much. So what we see is the upper limit is always determined by tolerance. So that's usually temperature or desiccation, and the lower limit is determined by biotic interactions, specifically either competition or predation. So let's talk about this. Way up top, so this is a classic example here, where way up top you have barnacles. Barnacles dominate, um, and we're talking about upper endotidal zone, this barnacle zone. Um, barnacles are these little arthropods that with a really thick shell, calcium shell that can close up very, very tightly. So they do a real good job of um, getting out of, like not drying out essentially. 
um, they will filter feed with their little appendages will come out and um, filter of all the phytoplankton, zooplankton that they can, they can catch. Um, but it's only for a very short amount of time each day. The rest of the day is they're hunkered down inside their closed shells waiting for the water to return. The thing is, as you get lower, you get more water more often, right? So this is like the barnacles way up here are dry for the longest amount of time. The barnacles down here are wet or are dry for not as long, right? Because it takes, there's, there's more um, time where water is here um, at the higher tides. But at this lower level, level they get outcompeted by mussels. Okay, the mussels are limited to a certain elevation because they dry out. Um, so they're only, you know, they, they, they can't go up high because they'll dry out and don't have um, that desiccation tolerance. But if you were to scrape off all the mussels and keep scraping off all the mussels that you would find, barnacles would go all the way down into, they, they, the barnacles would live fine right here. But they get outcompeted by the mussels. If if a baby, if you were to scrape off all the mussels and let the barnacles come down here, and then just wait a little bit, what you would see is um, baby mussels would come and land on here. Whether they're oysters or blue mussels, the ones that you eat, um, they would land on here and basically scrape off all the barnacles until um, you would just get pack full of mussels like we see here. So that um, that muscle zone is that next zone that we see. So so here's where we're talking about that muscle zone. And that lower limit then is set by sea stars. Okay, I took this picture here in Oregon and what you see is all these sea, sea stars are at the lowest tide just waiting to try to get up into this um, area and eat all the mussels. So, you know, this, what happens though, is if you completely in the bottom areas, get rid of sea stars, those muscles will expand downward and you'll get just an area completely chock full of muscles. Again, you should have at the top some um, barnacles, but you would still be stuck with all muscles down here. Sea stars are what we call a keystone species. There's a disproportionate effect based on their abundance relative, the, their relative abundance. Sea stars aren't that common, but um, you know, they're all predatory and they're all, they're really slow moving. You don't see them move, but they are, you know, a lot faster than their muscles that are cemented to a rock and can't move at all. The thing is they need that frequent inundation. At the lower bounds, they, um, they will dry out very quickly if they don't get, um, uh, the, the high tide coming back, but that's going to happen every day, right? Unless our moon goes away, which it won't, um, it's going to be fine, right? So what, um, what this ha creates then are these um, different zones. Now, depending on where we're at, so this is like the general Atlantic zone where they have a um, lichens and encrusting algae, then barnacles, then the um, mussels and the, the certain type of algae, then another type of algae, then another type of algae. So this is like barely ever exposed. Um, what we see though is um, different oceans will have different bandings, banding patterns. On the west coast you generally see barnacles, mussels, sea stars with, with some um, anemones or algae there. Um, in the Atlantic, you see barnacles, um, mussels, and seaweeds here. So different oceans will have different bandings, but that banding pattern is consistent across different, um, different oceans. So coral reefs, right? Coral reefs are the next habitat I want to talk about. And this is really a story of diversity, but diversity in a different way necessarily. Coral reefs are extremely diverse when we think about phyla, but not necessarily when we think about species. Tropical rainforests have way more species, but it's really just a bunch of insects and a bunch of plants. That's really all you find. I, I know there's not true, that's not true. You find mammals and all sorts of 
um, different things. But realistically, it's just insects and plants. Whereas coral reefs, you find sponges, cnidarians, mollusks, arthropods, chordates, echinoderms, everything, right? Worms. Um, and what the reef is, is real, realistically a limestone structure that is secreted by the corals. Remember, corals are basically tiny little jellyfish encapsulated in a calcium carbonate shell. These are found in tropical waters, shallow tropical waters. They have to be relatively warm, uh, not too warm, right? We'll talk about that later on, but, um, and relatively shallow, less than 50 meters in depth. Now, when you look at coral reefs, um, it's really a story of huge three-dimensional complexity. And this is impossible to show with a two-dimensional picture um, you just need to scuba dive or snorkel around in a coral reef because without without that you can't you just cannot imagine how three-dimensional these systems are so that's gonna make so many um, spots available for all the different organisms that are living in these systems so corals are in the class Anthozoa of the cnidarians right and but that's not all they are, right? They're a jellyfish, essentially, with a symbiotic relationship with these zooxanthellae. Now, their reliance is really dependent on depth. So you see the shallowest corals really need drive a huge portion of their energetic budget from the sugars that the zooxanthellae themselves are producing. But deeper algae will, um, you know, the ones that are down maybe to 100 feet, um, 30 meters will not really have that much um, th they won't get they will get fewer of their calories from the sugars of the zooxanthellae but realistically what we're seeing now is that there's a lot of really deep corals that we didn't really know existed um, but lots of you know 2,000 meters down no sunlight whatsoever there's corals that are growing that are not that do not have any um, zooxanthellae so you might see well these look like bleached corals. Well, they're not bleached corals, right? They're just um, completely transparent corals with a uh, calcium carbonate skeleton that you're seeing um, come through. And um, they never had any, they never had zooxanthellae to begin with, and they're doing fine way, way, way down deep. So corals reproduce by broadcast spawning, right? By releasing sperm in the egg, it, sperm and eggs out into the water. Uh, most of them are hermaphroditic, so they're going to be releasing sperm and eggs, so they don't self, like the sperm don't, won't recognize the eggs, or the, I should say the other way around, the eggs won't recognize the sperm of the, of the same individual, but um, the, uh, so they, they, sperm and the eggs unite, fertilize in the water, and larvae will be meroplankton for a little bit, and then um, settle out into the water, um, or onto, hopefully, um, rocky sediments that they can grab onto or a dead coral that they can grab onto and start their own colony. The thing is they have millions of babies, right? But they're extremely high mortality. So they um, definitely um, need to produce a lot, a lot of babies if they have any, want any chance of those uh, little larval um, corals to be growing. So coral reefs um, kind of depend on the age of how, how they can can work and uh, maintain themselves depend on the age of either the island or the reef itself. So let's take like a like Hawaii, right? And if you look at um, the island of Hawaii, if you go from east to west in Hawaii, the islands get older, um, and the islands are actually smaller because you on the islands way out in the western edge of the Hawaiian island chain, you don't have active volcanoes anymore. So what happens is the 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 volcano erupts, makes an island, and because those larvae are all in the water, they eventually get to the reach, get to the island, and create a fringing reef. As the volcano then goes away, what you left with is a barrier reef because the the island itself is eroding away, but the barrier reef is still there until you get to the point where they all of the rock, the volcanic rock, has eroded away, and what you're left with is an atoll, 
they might ask well won't the island eventually you know the underwater stuff here eventually go away and the answer is yes that island is still eroding away but the corals themselves are able to grow that faster than the erosion of the um, of the limestone structure. So the reef is growing faster than it can erode away and that maintains the atoll um, perpetually then. All right, let's go out then into the deep open ocean or um, shouldn't say deep yet but the, the out in in the water open ocean you know a thousand miles away from shore. If you look at the open ocean it's extremely non-productive. So this is primary productivity in grams of carbon per square meter per year and very few, right? There's very little carbon being produced or being um, put into photosynthesis, right? And remember when eutrophic versus oligotrophic lakes. In oligotrophic lakes we had tiny plankton doing better. It's even more uh, more so in the open ocean where you have nanoplankton or picoplankton which are super super tiny plankton that are mainly prokaryotic but still doing photosynthesis and um, that's what's going to be driving the ecosystem in these in these open ocean settings. The water is so clear then that you can actually have uh, light induced um, damage so what you'll see is in the most clear water you, you know, a couple meters down into the water you'll, is where you'll find the um, maximum productivity because all of this stuff is getting UV light that's really harming um, those algae and not allowing them to grow at that uh, until a couple of meters down into the water. Um, this can control as production as much as nutrients in the absolute uh, most clear water. So we're talking like way out in the Pacific Ocean and the, in the Atlantic Ocean. So one thing we see is that um, we can really track how much productivity is based on this thing called the red, red field ratio. If you look at um, phytoplankton out in the, in the open ocean, it generally follows this average ratio of 106 parts carbon, 16 parts nitrogen to one part phosphorus. Um, and whether, so this 16 to 1 line is that re referencing nitrogen and phosphorus and we see wherever we uh, kind of look at phytoplankton it's really right close to that. Um, so this was discovered in the open ocean and now we can actually use this in pretty much lots of different places when we're looking at algae, freshwater too. Um, and any deviation that you find basically allows us to determine where what nutrient is limiting. So if we find um, a bunch of algae that's at a nitrogen to phosphorus ratio of 20 to 1, we know that phosphorus is limiting quite strongly there. But if you were to find something like 10 to 1, then you would know nitrogen was limiting there. This also allows us to track one element you only need to figure out how to me measure carbon, which then gives you an idea of how much nitrogen and phosphorus is being used in the system. So in the open ocean, what we see is the, um, it, the, the nanoplankton, the extremely small stuff, coccolithophores and dinoflagellates out there are extremely small and going to be dominating the, the productivity just because the, the bigger algae just has no chance to be able to grow uh, or compete not necessarily compete but um, it's just not a, as efficient to grow a big algae of the bigger stuff what you find is mostly jelly like things um, so a lot of jellyfish, weird jellyfish, tenophores. Um, these are selps, which are these colonial organisms that um, have, I believe these are eyes, uh, don't quote me on that, but um, there's these long tubular cylindrical organisms that uh, filter water through their bodies and um, 
which would go up and down the water column hundreds of meters per day. But most organisms here are going to be um, either meroplankton that will come out eventually or um, jelly-like organisms. What we see now is um, the zooplankton, the copepods, are going to really dominate this system and they're going to be the link here in the food web. So they're going to be linked to the krill um, and um, really be the source of the food web for the rest of the things that you find in the open ocean. So let's go deep then. So we were out in the open ocean up, up shallow. Let's go deep, okay? The, um, it's hard, I think, to maybe generalize about this, also because this is extremely um, understudied. We don't really know much about what lives down there because it's so freaking hard to get down there. We only have a couple submer submersibles that can make it down there to 6,000 meters, let alone the 11,000 meters. Right now we have zero submarines that could go down all the way to the bottom of the trenches. So we can let's talk a little bit about what we've learned at the larger spatial and temporal scales. Um, and that's what that's called is macroecology. Macroecology explains the statistical patterns of abundance distribution and diversity. And we have a little better idea of how that works. What we generally see is biomass is negatively correlated with depth, okay? Not super surprising. The deeper we go, the less stuff we find. And that's really because food availability decreases as you're out in the middle of the ocean, right? This is a desert with nothing out there. All it is is water with some algae that are floating down to the bottom. The farther away you are from the coast, the less food is available, especially down deep. So it's really hard to sample. As you can imagine, you need a submersible or you need a really cool device that can go way down there with a really long rope, right? Um, what we actually see though is diversity increases with depth below the continental shelf. Now that's, that's not to say, okay, um, the continental shelf is more diverse, but then as you dive off the continental shelf and then go out and get deeper, once you're at that bottom of that continental shelf and then go deeper, you see diversity actually increases. Um, and it at times can, the, the diversity of organisms can um, exceed the temperate coastal diversity, um, not the tropical coastal diversity for sure. You can have, in those sediments that are way down deep, you can have up to 300 species per square meter. But as you can imagine, they're extremely tiny, right? So why are they small, right? This is really a story of small organisms. If you look at, um, so a study was looking at um, the size of organisms in Scotland in the loch, like an estuary versus a deep down trough, you find that the mean invertebrate weight was 0.039 grams. Again, that's not very much, right? That's 39 milligrams, but that's better than two milligrams that you would find in the way down deep stuff. Essentially, everything down there is super tiny, super tiny myofauna that will live in between the sand grains. So you'll find um, miniaturization of a lot of species. Um, so arthropods will generally be smaller out there to be able to fit with this in the sand grains, um, in, uh, in between the sand grains with the low amount of food. But interestingly, we see some reverse trends too. So uh, this is an ostracod. If you know anything about ostracods, ostracods are generally the size of like a grain of rice or smaller than that. Um, but deep sea ostracods can be very large. This is a deep sea roly-poly isopod. Um, the ones we find around here are about, um, let's see, the size of two grains of rice, let's say. So. We do find some bigger things down there, but on average, everything way down deep is much, much smaller. 
All right, that's it for ocean habitats. Um, we'll come back and talk about uh, human impacts on oceans here in the next lecture.